<laughs> okay, so optimization. We are trying to, uh, by the way, tomorrow is Ninja Day. Not today. Tomorrow is Ninja Day. We're trying to find, um, it says the dimensions. Okay, so that's important. We need to walk away with some dimensions. What are the dimensions of the rectangle that produces the rectangle with maximum area? So just to review, so we can go through the entire process of a optimization problem. We know it's, it's an optimization problem because it says to find maximum area. Good. Of a rectangle. So in this case, you can actually draw a figure. And sometimes drawing the figure is helpful. It helps you orient yourself to what you're doing. Also allows you to maybe label some of the dimensions. In this case, we called it W for width and I guess L for length. You want to start then, once you have your variables for your unknowns, with the equation for what it is you're trying to optimize. I call it the primary equation or the optimal equation. And it's the area of a rectangle, which is just A for area equals L times W. All right, so now we're trying to get that equation into a single uh, variable, either area as a function of L or area as a function of W. And that's always going to come back to the constraint. What's preventing you from making it infinitely large? Well, the fact that the pipe cleaner is 8 inches long. And you have to make the connection then that 8 inches ends up being the what of the rectangle? The perimeter, right? So you have to come up with that on your own. So the perimeter of a rectangle is twice the length plus twice the width. And again, we're using our variables that we introduced, L and W. So then we say 8 equals 2L plus 2W. We can solve that for either of the two variables and plug it into the primary. We chose to solve for W, which is fine. So W is 4 minus L. That equation I put an asterisk by because in the end, once we find L, we'll need to come back there to find W. But at right now, we plug it into our primary equation, and we get area is L times 4 minus L. Now we have it as a function of L. At this point, it's a good time to think of a relevant domain, once you have it in terms of a single variable. What values of L make sense, just in general? Well, since we're talking about a length, it has to be positive length. So I know that L has to be bigger than zero. And just as a safe upper bound, it has to be less than eight. There's no way it's going to be longer than eight because that's the full pipe cleaner. So that's a safe upper bound. Now, that puts you basically on an open interval because if the length is zero, there's no area. If the length is eight, there's no area. So somewhere in between zero and eight, there should be a place where we actually have an area You could, you, could, you could even do that, yeah, because if, if you're thinking it has to be a rectangle, you know, and there's 8, you're going to have to at least bend it in half at, at the point 4 and then fold it back over on itself. So, yeah, if you want to even do better than that, you can maybe narrow it down to that. That's fine. That's why I said 8 is a safe upper bound. Um, what's important, though, is to realize that the endpoints don't make sense. All right, and for a geometric problem, usually the endpoints collapse your structure down to nothing um, on either dimension, and that means that the optimal value is going to be the critical value, which is what we're after now. So A equals L times 4 minus L. We need to find the critical values of that, and uh, you want to use the product rule, or do you want to distribute and then use the power rule? I would probably distribute, because... Uh, going to be easier. Now I'm going to put A of L just to show that it's a function of L. You wouldn't need to do that. We get 4L minus L squared. Now that's, that's insightful as well because if you notice that is going to give you a graph of a what? A quadratic. And because the coefficient that's in front is negative, it's a parabola that opens down. That is very, very important in terms of justifying because you know then that the vertex, whatever value that is, is not only going to be a local maximum location, but an absolute maximum location, which is what we're after. We're after the absolute maximum area, not the local. So let's go ahead and find the derivative. And we get 4 minus 2L. We set it equal to 0, and we get 4 equals 2L. And we get L equals 2. Now, the hardest part, or not the hardest part, but maybe the least fun part about the optimization on a free response is justifying. Since we don't have a closed interval, we can't justify using the EVT. You would have to say something to the effect that the area is maximized when L is 2, since um, you could either use a modified first derivative test everywhere to the right of 0, um, L, uh, A prime is positive, and everywhere to the right of 0, A prime is negative. Therefore, it's not just a local max, 
an absolute max, because we say everywhere to the left and everywhere to the right. You could even do a modified second derivative test. What do you know about the graph everywhere? It's concavity. It's concave down everywhere over our relevant domain. And because the function is concave down everywhere over our relevant domain, then our critical value has to be and not just a local max, but an absolute max. We're not going to get into the words and justifying that right now. Because what happens, especially in a geometric problem where the endpoints don't make sense, if you get one critical value, it's going to be the value you want. Okay, so now that I have L equals 2, I know that's going to be the length that maximizes my area. I need to make sure I answer the question. Did it want the area or did it want the dimensions? It wanted the dimensions, okay? So in general, you can't just say it's going to be a 2 by whatever because the variables could, could, be, um, they could be different. Like when we had the first problem where a number times another number squared, it mattered which one we were squaring. So let's go ahead and find W then. We'll plug it back into this one. And we get 4 minus 2, which is 2. So this one does end up being a 2 by 2 rectangle, also known as a what? A square. So <clears throat> is it surprising to you that the most optimal rectangle ends up being a square? That is, maximizes the area per, per um, perimeter? For any given perimeter, the uh, the rectangle with the most area is going to be the one that's square. Does that surprise you? Well, if you have any experience with Mother Nature, it probably shouldn't because Mother Nature loves symmetry, and Mother Nature optimizes um, naturally. The most optimal rectangle is a square. Okay. Now we can, we've just proved that essentially. Let's go ahead and say so. So the dimensions, the dimensions. Or, and I'm going to go ahead and just say L equals 2 inches by W equals 2 inches. You could get away here with just saying two, 2 by 2, right? Because it doesn't matter which one is 2. They're both 2. But in general, the, uh, they're not always going to be the same. All right, good to know. All right, so let's move on to another type of geometric. A lot, a lot of these geometric problems show up. We have a ladybug farmer now which is a farmer who farms ladybugs, right? Okay. He has 500 inches of fencing, 500 inches of fencing. He has it on hand in his ladybug supply shed, and he wants to fence off a rectangular field, small little rectangular field um, that borders on a straight river, okay, to enclose his grazing ladybugs. So you got, you got it? He's going to make a little pasture that abuts up to a river that's straight, and he wants to fence it off so his ladybugs can graze. And he's clipped their wings uh, gingerly so that they can't fly over the fence. Okay? He needs, he needs no fence along the river. He needs no fence along the river because ladybugs can't swim. And as I mentioned, he's clipped their wings. Okay? Gingerly, delicately. Well, the river is going to end up being one of the boundaries. Okay. No, they're not going to crawl into the river. They can't swim, and they don't want to. Uh... Right, so he's got 500 inches of fencing that he's going to border on the other three sides. No, 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 this is ladybug fencing. It's crawl-proof. They can't crawl through it. All right? Here's the question. What are the dimensions of the field? What are the dimensions of the field that's going to provide the most grazing area for his is hungry ladybug. All right, so let's go ahead and draw a little picture. If it's a problem that's geometric, a picture can be helpful. So there's the straight river. Um, he's going to build a fence along the river like that, and this ends up being uh, the grazing area right here inside. Okay, he doesn't need to build a fence along the river. He's going to build it right up to the edge of the river, and the ladybugs can graze inside there. All right, so we need to call the dimensions. It ends up being rectangular. What do you want to use, X and Y, A and B, L and W again? Okay, so we use L and B, ladybug. Good. So notice we're calling B the perpendicular distance to the river, and L is the parallel uh, length along the river. And we're trying to maximize the grazing area. So what quantity is that? We want the most space for those ladybugs to graze. That's the perimeter? Area. Okay, good. So we're going to write our primary equation. I'm going to call it A for area, 
and it's another rectangle, so it's L times B. I need to then make that in terms of either L or B. And what's preventing us from making the ladybug grazing area infinitely large besides the constraints of the world itself? He has what that he wants to use? 500 feet of fencing. So that's his constraint. His constraint is he doesn't want to have to go buy more ladybug fence. So he's just going to use what he has on hand. So 500 ends up being, is it the full perimeter? In this case, no, because the river acts as one of the sides. So it's going to be L once, right, plus B twice, so 2B. So L plus 2B. Got it? Now I can solve that equation for either variable, whichever is easier, and plug it into my primary. Which one's easier to solve for? Probably L. Very good. That's a very definite answer. It depends on the person. Some person who likes a challenge who thinks challenges are easier than non-challenges. Whatever. I'm solving for L. I'm solving for L. All right, and I'm going to come back to that maybe if I need uh, L later on. But for right now, I'm going to plug that in right there, and I get the area is 500 minus 2B times B. And there you go you now have a, an equation for the area in terms of B, the perpendicular length coming off the river. A relevant domain for B. Okay, and, it, and this doesn't have to be exact. Okay? What values of B make sense? B ends up being a length, right? So just like before, we know it has to be positive. It's going to be some positive number. It's probably going to be less than 500 as well, right? If you want to get an upper bound, negative values of B don't make sense. That's all we really need to think about. All right, so the endpoints don't make sense. It's going to collapse this. If he just rolled out the fencing along the river, that wouldn't have any area at all, right? If he just pegged it at the river and just rolled it out perpendicularly, he'll just have a line of fence. It's not no area at all. So this is another geometric problem where the endpoints aren't going to make sense, which means somewhere in between a, a safe flow or an upper bound, which might be 0 and 500, there's going to be an optimal value. And how do we find those optimal values? They occur at what of the function? Global maximums occur, in this case, not at endpoints, but at critical values. Good. So we need to find the critical values, which means we need to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. I'm going to go ahead and distribute again. I get 500B minus 2B squared. And if you notice, once again, our equation is a parabola that opens down. And what that does is it gives us the assurance then that the critical value will exist and it will not only just be a local maximum location but the absolute maximum location. So A prime then is going to be 500 minus 4B. We set that equal to zero. So we get 4B equals 500. And then I divide through by 4, and I get 125. And I know that that is the answer that I want, right? And again, 99 times out of 99 and a half, if you get a single critical value, that is going to be the value that you're interested in. And I guess the units would be inches. We don't have to justify here. We know it's going to be the location of the max. All we have to do now is answer the question. Are we looking for the actual area or the dimensions? What are the dimensions of the field? Okay, so we're going to supply these to the ladybug farmer at no charge, okay, because we're nice. So the dimensions, dimensions are, and again, I'm going to say B equals 125 inches by, and then I just need to find L. How do I find L? I plug it back in up here, right? And let's see if it's going to be a square. Let's see. If I plug in a 125 up here times 2, that's uh, 250. 500 minus 250? 250. 250. Did his optimal grazing field end up being a square field? No. Why not? One side was the river, yeah. If he had to make all four sides out of that 500, guess what the shape would be to maximize the area? 
then it would be a square. Yeah. So uh, in this case, you can't just say the dimensions are 125 by 250 because it matters which one it is. If you don't tell him which one is which, he might start rolling out the fence perpendicular to the river, go out 250, turn around, come back 250, and now all of a sudden he's just bent his fencing in half and there's no area. So it does matter that we're calling 1B and 1L, okay? What if we wanted to know what the actual area was? How could we find that? Well, now that we have both of them, we can just multiply them together. But if you were interested in the area and not the other dimension, remember either one of these two equations right here give you the area quantity in terms of B and B alone. So you could just plug your 125 into either one of those, which is essentially on the top one, finding the other dimension and multiplying it. Okay, so now we don't have to mess around with trial and error, right? Trial and error, that's not a good way to, to do this. Ladybugs get impatient. You know what it is? Now we can go out and build it. Happy ladybugs. Pretty straightforward type problem. Questions so far? All right, example. What's that? I did like that. Yeah, this is, I, li I like this too. I like this too. Example four. The same ladybug farmer, different or same? Has has purchased, has purchased with a D, has purchased, okay, has purchased some expensive, extraordinary diva ladybugs. You know what I'm talking about. Who require exactly, exactly 10,000 square inches of grazing. They're divas, right? No more, no less. They require 10,000 square inches of grazing in order to be at their optimal ladybug-like state. Diva ladybugs. All right, so the farmer now, since he's invested in these diva ladybugs, he's going to have to go out and purchase the required fencing. Right? He can't just use what he has on hand and say, deal with it, divas. Divas don't deal with it. You deal with divas. What is the least amount of fencing that's required then to get these diva ladybugs at their optimal state if the farmer is still allowed to build along the very same straight river? Don't think diva ladybugs can swim and won't have their wings clipped. Okay, so we're just kind of changing the scenario a little bit. Let's go ahead and draw the picture. There's the same river. Now what he needs to do is build a pen so that the enclosed area is what? 10,000 square inches? Now, the ladybug fencing is expensive, so he doesn't just want to enclose any old reeds, and that includes 10,000. He wants to do it with the least amount of fencing. So let's go ahead and use the same letters, L and B, might as well. What is it now that we're trying to optimize? The, 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 the perimeter, essentially. But we're not trying to maximize it, we're trying to... Minimize it, right. So if we're trying to minimize instead of maximize, is that still optimization? Yes, it is. We're trying to minimize the amount of fencing. So let's go ahead and write the equation first for the quantity we're trying to optimize. What do you want to call the fencing? F for fencing? P for perimeter? I'll, I'll use F for fencing. And it's going to be L once, right, plus 2B. So essentially what was our constraint in the previous problem is now the quantity that we're trying to optimize. Well, that is the fencing now in terms of both L and B. We want it to get either in terms of L or in terms of B. What's preventing us from making our fencing as, as big or as small as we want? The fact that it has to what? Be 10,000. So that's our constraint and that's the area. So in this case, our constraint is the area and that's L times B. So we've kind of just switched it from the previous problem. Our constraint and our optimal equations have interchanged. So we set 10,000 equal to L times B. Now, same procedure. Once you get this far, the procedure is the same. You solve your constraint equation for either variable, and you plug it into your primary equation. Now notice that uh, the constraint equation is just as easy to solve for L or B. When you plug it into F, you're going to have to double it if you plug in for B. You won't have to double it if you, if you solve it for L. It doesn't matter. I'll let you tell me which one to do. 
You want to solve for L? All right. So L would equal 10,000 divided by B. All right. So we might have to come back to that. I'm going to plug that in right here now, and I get our fencing is 10,000 divided by B plus 2 times B. And that right there is what we're trying to minimize, right? Minimize. Now, what's a relevant domain? Once again, just to think about it, B has to be greater than 0. Thank goodness, because notice the first term, if B is 0, we get undefined. So for positive values of B, it looks like it's going to work. All right, so if the endpoints, again, don't make sense, we don't have a closed interval here, it's going to have to occur at the critical value if it happens at all. How do we find critical values of any function? Take the derivative. We need that. Okay, so let's go for it. F prime. 10,000 divided by B. I'm going to do this kind of out loud in my head with y'all. That's the same as 10,000 B to the negative first, right? By the power rule then, that will be negative 10,000 B to the negative second, which simplifies to negative 10,000 over B squared. Okay, if you need to write it in more steps, that's fine. And then the derivative of 2B is 2. Now notice that this derivative is undefined, which is always a critical value potentially, when B is what? Zero. But that's not even in the domain of our fencing equation. So it's not a critical value. And even if it were, it wouldn't be one that's relevant to us. So we want to know where this thing is equal to zero. Okay, well, um, I can solve this now one of two ways. I can get it as a single fraction on the left and then set the numerator equal to zero, which we know the benefit now of having a full-fledged factored version of the derivative. Or we can just use it algebraically and dispose of the, the nature of the derivative and solve for b, which I'm kind of into that right now because I don't think we're going to have to plug it back in. So I'm just going to leave the two on the left Bring that term over and make it positive. And now if I multiply both sides by B squared and divide both sides by 2, I get B squared equals half of 10,000, which is 5,000. And if I extract the square roots, we always want to at least remember to consider both plus or minus. But do we want a negative version here? Nope. So it looks like B is going to be the positive square root of 5,000 which is, um, that's the same as 50 times 100, which is, yeah, the, the 100 square root becomes the 10, but 50 is also 25 times 2, right? So we can pull out the square root of 25, we can pull out a 5 and make that a 2. Is everyone okay with that? Not that we necessarily have to do that. Depends if we're on a calculator question or, or not. But it is, a, it is an irrational number. It ends up being 50 square root of 2, and uh, what are the units? Inches. Now, the question is, that is a critical value. If we're the farmer, we want to make sure that that's the value that actually minimizes the amount of fencing and not maximizes it. What if that's a critical value that maximizes the amount of fencing we have to use? Now we're spending all this money on Diva Ladybug fencing that we didn't want to have to, to purchase to begin with. That's the whole reason we did this. How do we know if that's going to be the location of a absolute min and not an absolute max? I could do a first derivative test. And this is what the justification kind of looks like. Um, let's, let's have our value of B and F prime. We're doing it with B and F prime instead of X and f prime. We only had one critical value, uh, 50 square root of 2. And remember, our relevant domain is always important. So we have to, not a bracket, we have to be strictly greater than 0. So if I pick a number that's less than 50 square root of 2 but greater than 0, what would a number like that be? 1. Good. And how about a number um, bigger than 50 square root of 2? 100. Good. Let's plug it back into our derivative, and it has to be the full-fledged one over here. And notice I don't even have a, um, 
I don't have a single fraction there, so let's see what we get there. If I plug in a 1, I'm going to get negative 10,000 plus 2. That should be a negative number, right? Now, is it, what are we saying? We're saying now that it should be negative, not just immediately to the left of 50 square root of 2, but everywhere to the left of 50 square root of 2 on down to what? Zero, our lower bound. So now everywhere to the left of 50 square root of 2, up to what's relevant to us, the slopes are zero, or the slopes are negative, approaching the slope of zero. So it's decreasing everywhere, 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 everywhere to the left, hitting a low point. And if I plug in 100, 100 squared is going to be, oh, that's, that's good. 100 squared is going to be 10,000. So negative 10,000 over 10,000 is negative 1. Negative 1 plus 2 is positive 1. And since that's the only critical value, not only is f prime positive immediately to the right of 50 square root of 2, but we're saying it's positive everywhere to the right of 50 square root of 2. So not only then are we going to have a local minimum at 50 square root of 2, but we're going to have an absolute minimum because everywhere to the left it's decreasing to that low point and everywhere to the right forevermore it's increasing beyond that. So it never gets below that. So now we know for sure that this is the value that minimizes absolutely our fencing and not maximizes it. Poof. Now we walk away because we're tired of ladybugs? No, we answer the question. It says, what's the least amount of fencing? So in this case, it didn't ask you for the dimensions. We want to figure out the actual amount of fencing that we need. So once we have our optimal quantity, if we needed the other dimension, we can plug it in there. If we need the actual amount of fencing, we plug it back into here. So here we go. So the amount of fencing needed, so uh, 10,000 divided by 50 square root of 2 plus 2 times B plus, we can just call that, I guess, 100 square root of 2 inches of fencing is needed. Make sure you answer the question that was specifically being asked. Now, does anyone see anything wrong with that answer? What if you went over to the store and, like, uh, the NB Feed Supply, and you said, I need 10,000 divided by 50 square root of 2 plus 100 square root of 2 linear feet or linear inches of fencing? There's probably a couple things wrong. What? Yeah. Um, Aside the fact that you're giving them a fraction and not a single number, because right, they'll have to compute that, and that you're asking them for linear inches of fencing because they probably sell it by the foot, right? the astute person working behind the counter or wherever you're going, the help desk, is going to realize that the square root of 2 is an irrational number, and they're saying, sorry, sir, um, rolls do not come in that size. And you're like, okay, well, can you just cut me down a roll? Uh, and that number, like, sorry, sir, I cannot, right? Because what? What's wrong with the irrational number? It doesn't end, right? You cannot cut fencing that exact length. We know it's there somewhere on the number line by the will ordering principle, but like pi and e, we can't pinpoint it down. So uh, what would you do then? Yeah, just, just tell the guy to round up to the nearest probably five billionth of a decimal, right? Because you don't want to be paying too much. Don't round, don't round to the nearest inch. No way. I don't want to pay for all that extra stuff. Just, just round up. Make sure you round up and not down. Because if you round down, what's going to happen? You're going to have a little tiny hole in the fence. And how big are ladybugs? They're very little tiny, and they can squeeze through that little tiny hole. So you round up. You pay a little bit more than maybe you wanted. But that's, that, you should have anticipated that when you got into the ladybug business to begin with, right? Okay. So that's the basic idea of building fences. You notice uh, a little bit different. We, in one, we were trying to maximize the area. This one, we're trying to minimize the materials. Is there another way to do it? Yes. I've had a problem in here before where we try to minimize the cost. And if we assume maybe that it costs the guy more to build the fence perpendicularly to the river because it requires more work down here, down by the river, you can come up with a cost equation and minimize that. 
but we're not going to do that with the ladybug. I'm kind of tired of the ladybug. All right, so those are your geometric problems. So far, so good? Not a big deal? Kind of fun, kind of? Yeah, all right. Um, sometimes endpoints are relevant, sometimes. They haven't been in the geometric problem or in the first problem, but let's see. I'm guessing maybe they are in this one. Find the point on the curve y equals x squared that's closest to the point 3, 0. Is that optimization? No? Oops. Closest. What does that mean? The most close, right? Yeah. We're trying to maximize closeness. It is optimization. Anytime you have the superlative case, closest, right, it's an optimization. We're trying to maximize closeness. Okay, good. So um, this is a problem that's not geometric in the sense of building a fence, but it is something that you could actually draw a picture to kind of orient yourself to what's going on. Uh, the graph of y equals x squared, we know, we know keenly what that's going to look like. It looks like that. And we're trying to find the point on the graph of that parabola now that is the nearest, that is the closest to the point 3, comma 0. I'm just going to arbitrarily draw that right there. All right. Now, let's look at it. Can you, can you tell just by the eyeball method where on the parabola it's closest to the point 3, 0? No, I can't either. But I do know where it's not. It's not over here, right? That's not the closest point. I can eliminate lots of points. In fact, I know that it's not going to be anything. If I'm looking horizontally, it might be the origin, right? That might be the closest distance. I doubt it. But if that's x equals 0 and that's not it, I know it's not going to be anything over here, right? Because as I, as I move left now, the distance from the point on the parabola to the pink point is getting bigger and bigger. So I think 0 would be a safe lower bound for x. Would you agree? Similarly, if I look right here at x equals 3 and I go straight up to the parabola, maybe this distance is closer, right? It depends on how flexed or stretched the parabola is. But if this is not the winning point, I know that this point over here, like at x equals 5, that's not going to be it, right? Because now if I move to the right of x equals 3, the parabola point is moving further away from, from 3. So I know that if I'm talking about x values, it might be somewhere between x equals 0 and 3. And in this case, it very well could be at 0, and it very well could be at 3. Would you agree? The endpoints actually make sense now. But it's not going to be anything outside of that interval. Now, it very well could be some other point, like right there. It could be something on the parabola in between 0 and 3. I don't know. All right, so now that I've got kind of a relevant domain before I even start, I need to write some equations. Do I just take the derivative of y equals x squared and find its critical value? Nope. We're trying to maximize closeness, which means we're actually trying to what? How do you maximize closeness? Take the limit of closeness? What's the equation for closeness? There you go. You have to reframe the question. To maximize closeness, you've got to minimize a quantity. So you're going to minimize the distance between an arbitrary point on the parabola, x, comma, y, and the point of interest, 3, comma, 0. So if you want to come over here, you could just call this brown point x comma y, and then this is the point 3 comma 0, and you could draw that line in between there, and that would be the distance. So the two green lines are also the distance. The line right there is the distance. What do you want to call the distance? D? Yeah, I'll call it big D. All right, so now the distance formula is what we're looking at. We're trying to minimize distance. The distance between two points, remember, it's just the Pythagorean theorem solved for the hypotenuse. It's the square root of, in general, the change in x squared plus the change in y squared. That's the general formula for the distance between two points. 
So for us, it's going to be x minus 3 squared plus y minus 0 squared. Some arbitrary point x, y on the parabola and uh, the point 3, 0. Now we can simplify that a little bit. We can call that x minus 3 squared plus y squared. Okay, that looks better. Now what's preventing us, notice it's two variables, it's in terms of x and y. What's preventing us from getting right up there in 3, 0 space as close as, as we want? The fact that we have to what? We have to be on the graph of the parabola. So the parabola itself is the constraint. We have to stay on the parabola. And remember, the constraint is always going to be the thing that enables you to put your primary equation in terms of one variable. So, so can we write an equation for the constraint that involves the parabola and also involves x and y? y equals x squared. Yeah, in this case, the equation of the parabola itself is the constraint, and it already relates x and y. So we don't need to solve it for x. It's already solved for y. That's definitely the easier of the two. So let's go ahead and substitute that in over here now. Now you could do that from the very beginning. Sometimes you don't even need to like think of it as being a constraint. Instead of thinking of an arbitrary point on the graph x, y, you could just call that point x comma x squared if you wanted to, right? Because that's what the graph is, x comma x squared. And then, and then you'd have it, okay? But it, it works the same way. So the distance, then, is now x minus 3 squared plus y squared, which is what's y squared? It would be x to the fourth. Ooh. Okay. Um, now we have our distance. And now, since we have x as our variable, we know that x has to be somewhere between 0 and 3. And the endpoints might be the winners. They might be the winners. We don't know. It could also occur where? On a closed interval. Critical value. Good. How do we find critical values? We say to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So we need to take the derivative here. Um, so here we go. D prime is. You want to expand the, the radicand or just leave it like that? Yeah, we can leave it. Yeah, so using the chain rule, the first layer is blob to the one-half, right? So the square root becomes one-half blob, which is all of this, to the negative one-half, times the next layer, which is two terms. So now we're in the radicand, and we have two terms. The first one, x minus 3 squared, is another chain rule. That's 2 times x minus 3 to the first times the derivative of x minus 3, which is 1. Just to be thorough, I'll have it there. And then the next term under the radicand is 4x cubed. And that takes care of the derivative. Wow, that looks pretty, pretty ugly. Well, let's clean it up then. Um, what do I have here? I'm going to have a shelf. The one-half in front means there's a factor of 2 in the denominator. The next factor is negative one-half, so that puts it back in the denominator like that. So really all that's left in the numerator is the little pink portion. And um, I can distribute the 2 now and uh, end up with 4x cubed plus 2x minus 3. 6, thank you, 6. Uh, 4x cubed plus 2x minus 6. Okay, so if I look for the critical values that make it undefined, those aren't going to be the values that make sense in practicality. So we're going to be looking for the critical values that make it equal to zero, the nice smooth horizontal tangent line. So because it's a quotient, it, it turns out that we're setting the numerator equal to zero. So I'm going to backtrack from this point and show you kind of another way to do it. The numerator, remember, came when we took the derivative of what? This pink piece was what we have now equal to 0. That came from the radicand's derivative, right? So here's the thing. If you have a function 
that is expressed as a single radical, if you're trying to minimize the radical, the whole thing, it's the same thing as trying to minimize the radicand. So if you just want to call the radicand something like R, and just look at it, if you square multiply double square, you get x squared minus 6x plus 9 uh, plus x to the fourth. Maybe that version of it. Minimizing the radicand, that is making the thing under the radical as small as possible, is going to also then guarantee that the square root of that number is as small as possible. And if you take the derivative of the radicand, you get 2x minus 6 plus 4x cubed, which is the same thing we have down here. So just a little kind of shortcut. You can always just take the derivative using the chain rule, and uh, it works out the same way. All right, so anyway, we need to solve this, this equation. And I don't have a calculator, and that's not one that necessarily factors very nicely, does it? No. So if you're faced with something like this, and let's just say in the real world, not necessarily in the AP Calculus exam, because you might not have something like this in the AP Calculus exam. It would probably be a quadratic that's easily factorable or be a calculator section. But let's find ourselves right now where we are with uh, some leftover donuts and no calculator. What would you do if you had to find an x value that made it zero? What, I mean, what could you do? There's a cubic formula out there. Do you have it memorized? I don't either. What would you do? Guess and check. Let's try zero. No, negative six doesn't equal zero. But maybe, what are some other nice numbers? Two. Two cubed is eight times four is 32 plus four is 36 minus six is 30. Doesn't equal zero. How about something nicer than two? Let's try one. Four plus two is six. Six minus six is zero. Okay, so x equals one. Now, that's just one of how many possible solutions? Well, it's a cubic, so it can have at most three. Three, at most three. Um, at most three. Um, so there might be two more, right? Now, let's talk about, first of all, x equals one. Is that one in our relevant domain between zero and three? Yes. Okay. How can we find the other two? Still without a calculator and leftover donuts. Keep on guessing or synthetic division. Right. Yeah. Because remember when we studied polynomials, if you can get it down to a quadratic, you're home free. Because you know the quadratic formula if you can't factor it. And all you need for a cubic to get down to a quadratic is one root. And we have it. So let's come over here. we got a 4x cubed, a 0x squared. A 2x and a negative 6. We're doing synthetic division. Not unlike what we did when we were evaluating limits of polynomials, right? When we got 0 over 0. We synthetically divide with the known root that we guessed. That we guessed. Um, on our third try. Bring down the 4. You multiply, you get 4, 4, 4, 6, 6. And you know you get 0. You know you get 0. We, we knew that. But what we were after were these coefficients, because that means it's 4x squared plus 4x plus 6. And now if I can find the remaining two, there might be another one in there that's between 0 and 3. That's what I'm after, right? If there's another critical value between uh, 0 and 3. Well, I'm going to go ahead and factor out a 2 from there just to make it easier. That gives me 2x squared plus 2x plus 3 equals 0. And now, I'm not even going to bother trying to factor that. I'm going to go straight to the quadratic formula because I love it, love it, love it. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And we all need to work on the, the quadratic piece. So here we go. Um, our a is 2, our b is 2, and our c is 3. So I get the opposite of 2 plus or minus the square root of 2 squared, which is 4, minus 4 times 2 times 3. That's going to be 24. I can kind of stop right there, can't I? All over 2 times 2 is 4. What do you notice about the uh, determinant? I think that's what it's called. The discriminant, that's what it's called. The determinant is um, when you're dealing with matrices. This is the determinant. 
You have A, B, C, D. It's A, D minus B, C. That's the determinant. The discriminant is B squared minus 4AC. Now, it's unfortunate because you can use the discriminant to determine how many solutions you have or to discriminate how many solutions you have. Uh, what are we going to get under the radical? Negative doesn't matter, right? It's negative. And the square root of negative means that the final two solutions are imaginary. So we have conjugate imaginary pairs. We're not after imaginary solutions, right? Okay. So there we go. So what do we know? We know that there's only one critical value, and it happens to be on our relevant domain. Now, in the previous problems, when we had a single critical value, it was the optimal value we were looking for, right? Because the endpoints did not make sense. They, they collapsed your GMX metric structure down to nothing. But in this case, the endpoints do make sense. So how am I going to determine now at which value of X on the parabola is closest to the point 3, 0? There's only three candidates now, right? X equals 0, X equals 3, and X equals 1. Yeah, the, the actual distance, right? Yeah, the y value is a function. So, yeah, yeah just, just plug them back in right here, right? Plug them in right there. You can actually play the game, right? So we need to find the distance when x is 0. We need to find the distance when x is 3. That's team endpoint, right? And now we need to find the distance at 1. Now, I'm going to go ahead and use the formula, and then we'll come back and talk about other ways for 0 and 3, because it should work out. Plug in a 0 here, and what do you get? You get... Uh, 9 plus 0 is 9. Square root of 9 is 3. Got it. Plug in a 3 and you get 0 plus 3 to the 4th is 81. The square root of 81 is 9. Now notice because those are your horizontal and vertical distances from the point, you don't really need the distance formula for that, right? We know how far away is the origin from the point 3, 0 horizontally. It's three units to the right. We, we just that verified that. It's not like you can leave it you need what is the distance here? Well, it's just going to be the y value of the parabola, because that's how far away it is from the x-axis. Well, if the parabola is y squared and we're at x equals 3, what's 3 squared? 9. So notice it does work out either way, if you plug them into the distance formula or calculate them because they're horizontal. But for 1, we need to use the distance formula. So what do we get when we plug in a 1? 1 minus 3 is negative 2. Negative 2 squared is 4. So we got a 4 plus 1 is 5. So we get the square root of 5, which, gosh dang it, we don't know what that is. But we do know that it's uh, about 2 point something. And we're trying to find the... Maximum or minimum distance? The minimum, yeah. So which of those is the smallest? Square root of 5, yeah. So now we'll answer the question. Find the point on the curve. So the closest point is when x equals 1, which is going to be 1 comma f of 1, or also known as 1 comma what? Well, well, we're trying to find the point on the graph. When x is 1, we just plug it back in up here, right? We plug it back into the constraint equation. 1 squared is 1. There you go. Wow. So the endpoints ended up not winning, but they were in contention in this problem. And sometimes, depending on how flexed that parabola is, how narrow or wide it is, and depending on the point that you're referencing, these are the types of problems where endpoints can sometimes be the answer. So you just to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. If it's ever a closest point to, if you're ever trying to minimize distance, the endpoints can sometimes be the answer. So you need to make sure you're, you're considering them. And then you can validate or verify by using your closed interval argument. Okay, good to know. Any questions on that one? All right, so we've, we've been talking about this the whole time. Ways to justify an absolute extrema. When you have um, 
the closed interval like we had up there right now. And, and again, we came up with our own relevant domain. So we're talking about like a closed interval that we provide or that could be given. You can do what we just did right here. This is the justification itself. When you show the computations of your quantity at your endpoints and at any critical value, that's your justification. Then you can go straight to your answer. That's using the EVT. When you don't have endpoints, you have to justify, um, if it says to, some other way. All right? Let's look at example six, see how far we can get. Find the point on the curve y equals cosine that's closest to the origin. Is it, is it an optimization problem? Yes, because you see the superlative case there. Again, we're trying to maximize closeness, which means we're trying to, we're trying to minimize the distance. And so we're on endpoint alert, endpoint alert. I don't know if we can make a portmanteau out of that, like cusp alert or vert alert, but we're on an endpoint alert. Y'all are already working on it. Good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and draw the picture here just to kind of help me see what's going on. Cosine, that's chala, right? So we start high, and it looks like that, and we come over here like that. And this cross is where? Where's the first x-intercept for cosine? Pi halves, right? And over here at negative pi halves, there's another one. And we're trying to figure out the point on that graph that is closest to the origin. All right, well, here's what I know. I know that it's either going to be pi halves units away on either side. Would you agree? because it's not going to be further away than that. Or it could be when x is 0, which is going to be, what's the amplitude of cosine? 1. Now, what do I already know based upon that? Is pi halves going to be the winner? The first x-intercept is pi halves units away, whereas the, 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 lo the local maximum value is only one unit away. Which one is smaller? 1. So I already know it's going to be not that endpoint, but pi halves gives me a safe endpoint. And there could be another point somewhere in here, right, where the distance is a little bit less than one. And I know if I have one over there, by symmetry, I'm going to have another one over here. So here's what I could do. Because of the symmetry, I can work in this little region right here. And I can come up with, a again, a feasible interval in which my minimum distance has to occur. It should be less than or equal to pi halves or greater than or equal to zero. And I know that if I have one x value on that open interval, it's going to be symmetrically, again, on the, on the negative side. All right, so let's choose an arbitrary point. We got the point zero, zero, which is not arbitrary. And here's where you can avoid the um, constraint equation altogether. A point on the graph of cosine is going to be x comma cosine of x. Would you agree? Instead of x comma y, where y is cosine of x, that allows you to define the point in terms of x exclusively. And now we'll go for our distance. The distance between two points is the change in your x. So what's x minus 0? x plus the change in your y's, which we're using cosine of x instead of y. Cosine minus 0 is cosine squared. So notice now we already have a primary equation that is in terms of a single variable. Y'all realize why? Because we didn't call this y. We called it cosine of x. All right, so now can we use our little trick? We're trying to minimize the radical. Can we just minimize the radicand? Yes. Now you're going to want to be sure if you do that that you don't call the radicand d. So I'm just going to call it r. And I'm going to go ahead and write it like that. So we're going to let R be the radicand. And if I'm trying to minimize the radical, I can minimize the radicand. That just takes some of the chain rule out of it. It makes the derivative less ugly. You can only do that if you're defining your entire quantity as a radical, though. Okay, so here we go. Let's find uh, the critical values. R prime is going to be 2x plus 2 cosine x sine of x negative sine of x, sorry, All right, 2 cosine of x to the first times the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine. And I want to set that equal to 0, so we get 2x 
minus 2 sine x cosine x, if I clean it up a little bit. Hmm. Okay, now, um, can we solve that without a calculator? I'm not quite sure. That's already the derivative. I can do something with that. What could I do with that? I could call 2 sine x cosine x sine of 2x. That takes one of the variables out of it. But because I have an x and a sine of x, I'm kind of stuck. I'm kind of stuck. Um, I need the help of a calculator at this point. So here's where we're going to actually pick up the calculator now. And this, keep in mind, would then be on a calculator portion of an exam. And you would then have to show all of this work up to this point. You would show the equation, essentially, that you're trying to solve. All right, so we're slowly going to be introducing, uh, reintroducing the calculator for uh, the purposes that serve us well. And one of them is solving equations. Come on, IMAX. Okay, so while this is trying to catch up, here we go. Go ahead, and if you have a calculator and you want to play along, watch the spinning beach ball. In Y1, you would type the equation that we're trying to solve, and in Y2, you would sketch zero, and then you would set your X min, X max to the interval that we're interested in, which is from zero to pi halves, and then you would set your Y min, Y max to something small and symmetrical like negative 3 to 3. And I wish I can show you, but apparently I'm out of RAM. Download more RAM. Yeah. Um, now, by the way, what mode should we be in if we're typing in a trig function? Radiance, right. In this class, never not radiance. You should always be in radiance. Okay, I'm getting tired of the beach ball. It'd be nice if we could just do this in the last few seconds, which would have worked perfectly uh, for recording purposes, but it looks like we're going to run out of time. All right, so you type that in there, and then in Y2, you type in 0. And what that does is it puts your x-axis right in the middle, and I'm frozen again. Okay, now here's the thing. What's going to happen, hopefully is when you sketch it, you're going to have an x-intercept. Now, are we trying to maximize or minimize? We're trying to minimize. If you graph it on your relevant window from 0 to pi halves, and I can't even switch back to my reflector, you're going to see a graph. You're going to see a graph that will cross. Come on. Okay. You're going to see a graph on your window. Here's 0. Here's pi halves. Here's your x-axis. For a minimum, you're going to see a graph that crosses like that. And so everywhere to the left of that x value, you're going to have negative, And everywhere to the right, it's going to be positive. And that's going to make it not just a local min, but an absolute min. And that would be your x value, okay? Possibly. If we didn't get a chance to explore. It could still be at an endpoint. 